Hello info person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to discuss some of the recent updates about one of the most famous exoplanetary systems out there, the TRAPPIST-1 system. The system located 41 light years away from Earth and that gained worldwide recognition when scientists unveiled a remarkable collection of seven Earth-sized planets orbiting a compact red dwarf star. And so here the sheer number of potentially habitable worlds, all tightly packed and all relatively close to us, made this the prime target for follow-up observations and of course observations with the James Webb Space Telescope. And now we finally get some new updates and additional discoveries about one of the planets in the system. Because here, for many years now, there's always been this tantalizing possibility that at least one of these planets is potentially going to support liquid water. But the thing is, so far, the universe reminded us that it doesn't like to conform to our expectations. Because some of the recent observations from the last few years started to reveal an entirely different picture about these planets and even about the entire star system. The picture that's a lot more complex than we initially thought, with basically chances for finding water slowly disappearing over time. And we'll actually discuss some of the previous discoveries about the first two planets, TRAPPIST-1b and c, in some of the videos in the description. But today we're going to discuss the third planet, TRAPPIST-1d. Because here these new findings present us both with unexpected challenges, but also crucial insights into the nature of these somewhat distant worlds. But before we start, let's just do a super quick overview of what exactly the star system is and what we've discovered about some of these planets in the last few years. First of all, this is once again a red dwarf system. Here the luminosity of this star is only like half a percent of what the sun produces with most of the radiation emitted in the infrared. And that means that any planet that could potentially host liquid water would have to orbit super, super close. But it just so happens that in this particular system, all seven planets labeled B through H, first of all, seem to be very similar in size to planet Earth. And second of all, many of them seem to fit in this hypothetical habitable zone, the area where we kind of do expect maybe liquid water to exist. But most of these planets are also probably tidally locked, always facing the star with the same side, with the other side being in complete darkness. And so given these unique characteristics, and also the fact that up to four planets could be inside the habitable zone, this system became the crucial target for the JWST, with one of the primary objectives being characterization of the atmosphere in order to find some kind of a gas, like for example water vapor, or maybe carbon dioxide or methane. But studying these planets is far from straightforward. As a matter of fact, there are quite a lot of challenges. And the biggest challenge is not the planets themselves, it's the star. And that's because TRAPPIST-1 is an active red dwarf. It's volatile, it releases a lot of bursts and produces many flares. And its surface is also covered with a lot of star spots or much brighter spots known as faculae. And all of this creates a lot of noise in observational data. This is known as the stellar contamination, and it can produce a lot of false positives even during very short observations. And so for many years now, one of the main problems and one of the main focuses of most studies was to essentially work out some kind of a technique or some kind of a solid strategy in how to observe these planets with minimal contamination, or in how to clean the stellar contamination once the planet has been observed. And this usually involves intricate modeling to try to account for as many star spots and faculae as possible in order to then isolate planetary atmospheric fingerprint, which in essence is what's basically being done right here in this recent study. But as you can imagine, this is a really challenging job. And so over the years, there's basically been this unspoken principle that most exoplanetary sciences try to follow. It goes something like, no thy star, no thy planet. Or just to rephrase this, without a precise understanding of stellar activity, it's going to be impossible to observe actual planets. But nevertheless, it has become possible for some of the closest planets, such as TRAPPIST-1b and TRAPPIST-1c. And just to summarize those two previous videos in the description, even though initially we thought TRAPPIST-1b seemed to be a somewhat empty planet without any atmosphere, some of the newer observations with the James Webb potentially suggested that it might be extremely thick in carbon dioxide and even contain some kind of a hydrocarbon smog. 
Now this hasn't been confirmed yet, but this was a pretty exciting discovery. In contrast, the second planet seems to have potentially rocky composition, but potentially does not contain carbon dioxide layer or any atmosphere rich in water, ammonia or carbon monoxide, implying that it's possibly also atmosphere free. But now let's turn our attention to TRAPPIST-1d. The planet that's roughly Earth-sized and potentially rocky, and it seems to be located at the inner edge of the star's habitable zone. And here a single year is just 4 days long. So basically it only takes like 4 days to see this planet transiting once again. And the goal was to detect molecules common in Earth's atmosphere, such as once again water, methane or maybe carbon dioxide. And well, once again, for some reason, nothing has been discovered. The overall spectra observed twice seems to be relatively flat, implying that the planet doesn't seem to contain any molecule in large amounts. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't have anything. It just means that right now there doesn't seem to be a thick atmospheric layer or a clear atmosphere made of water, carbon dioxide, methane, hydrogen or really some other gas that we usually attribute to atmospheres. And so here right now any specific atmospheric compositions have been ruled out with very very high confidence. Atmospheres similar to Mars, Venus, ancient Earth or modern Earth. And these observations were very sensitive. Enough to rule out methane at approximately 500 parts per billion or carbon dioxide at 6000 parts per billion. Although the sensitivity for water vapor was a little bit lower, 1400 parts per million. So if there is something here, it's only present in extremely small amounts. And I guess the question is, what exactly does this tell us about the star system and specifically about this planet? Well, I guess the easiest explanation is that TRAPPIST-1d is just a barren rock without any atmosphere. To some extent, kind of similar to Mercury. Or it does possess an extremely thin atmosphere, possibly similar to Mars, but with the amount of stuff that's barely detectable. But alternatively, there's actually another explanation. Maybe it does have atmosphere, but also extremely thick, high altitude clouds, or possibly some aerosols, that are essentially hiding gases from the detection by JWST. In other words, maybe it's just so thick and so ridiculously pressurized that it's just impossible to see what gases it even has because there's also a layer of clouds covering everything. And it's this last point that's maybe somewhat interesting. Because here, 3D global climate models do predict that TRAPPIST-1D may have water-rich atmosphere and so such clouds could maybe form on the night side and then extend to some other parts of the planet, obscuring atmospheric observations during transits. And so it might resemble something like this, but with maybe even more clouds that are essentially covering the entire night side and the twilight area between the dark and the bright sides. And this is kind of important because similar cloud formations were not predicted to exist on other planets such as 1b and 1c, but have been predicted to exist on 1d. And so here we do have a slight chance that this planet contains a very thick atmosphere and lots of lots of clouds hiding everything. But that's just one of potential explanations because the best explanation is still that this is a barren world. And if it is indeed a barren rock, it suggests that the inner planets of the system may have formed with significantly less water than previously assumed. This challenges the idea that water worlds are ubiquitous and also challenges the idea that M dwarfs or red dwarfs have a high chance of hosting habitable worlds, at least for planets orbiting very close to stars. But luckily this doesn't spell doom for the entire system yet. Because here the study also emphasizes that the fate of this planet does not necessarily dictate the atmospheric conditions for outer planets. And so here we're talking about planets E, F, G and H. These planets, being much farther from the star, would obviously receive less radiation, making it slightly easier for them to retain their atmosphere and possibly liquid water. They're also more likely to have cooled down sufficiently and possibly have stable conditions, allowing surface oceans to exist or even potentially forming ice worlds similar to Europa and Ganymede. But since these planets are farther away, they're also much more difficult to study. And so the James Webb Space Telescope observations of these outer planets is still ongoing and has not been completed yet. And so here we still have four potential chances to find something. So far the three nearest planets turn out to be maybe not so hospitable after all. But these observations in the last few years have also kind of grounded our expectations in terms of potentially discovering life somewhere out there. 
mostly because the search for bias signatures or signs of life, despite being the primary goal for the TRAPPIST-1 system, right now seems to be extremely challenging, potentially impossible. Because here, right now, we can't even seem to definitively find signs of gases either. And so discovering signs of some kind of a biomolecule would not be very easy at all. And so these initial observations of TRAPPIST-1D right now do not seem to give us a lot of hope for Earth-like conditions. Now they do take us a little bit closer to understanding exoplanetary habitability and do teach us quite a lot about planets that seem to be in habitable zones, but at the same time they also remind us that our planet, planet Earth, in many ways remains quite a special little place. A place that's just different from everywhere else. But the journey to explore these planets is going to continue for many years, because right now we still don't really understand what's going on here and what sort of planets these are. But I guess in conclusion, so what did we actually learn about this planet and what do we know about it so far? Well, first of all, just to remind you, this is a little bit smaller and less massive than Earth. It's about 78% the size and approximately 38% the mass. But because it also contains slightly less density than Earth, previously it was assumed to be due to some kind of a thick atmosphere, with maybe up to about 5% of the mass actually being some kind of a very thick atmosphere similar to Venus. But the new observations potentially suggest that this is not the case and its lower density is just because it contains less metals and is just overall a little bit more rocky. Now, since the assumption right now is that it seems to have no atmosphere since nothing was detected, this would also give us a very bizarre planet with a somewhat comfortable temperature on the surface. Its equilibrium temperature is potentially something close to about 9 degrees Celsius if it's very dark, or minus 15 Celsius if it's a little bit more reflective. But that's of course assuming there is nothing. If it does have that super thick atmosphere with very thick clouds on the surface, it would be much, much hotter. And so based on these observations, we can kind of assume that this is probably not a hospitable world and not a world capable of sustaining liquid water. So basically the first three planets, B, C and D, so far seem to be kind of inhospitable. Now I'm sure we're going to get some follow-ups and potentially some other analysis that might discover something else, but based on these very thorough observations and based on this very thorough analysis of the first three planets, we can assume that these three planets are not able to sustain life as we know it. But I'm sure in the next few months, we will probably get additional studies and most importantly, studies about the next planet, planet TRAPPIST-1e. The one that's essentially inside the habitable zone and the one that potentially contains something. And so until those studies and until we learn something else, that's all I wanted to mention. Check out some of the previous videos on a similar topic in the description. Thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining the channel membership that grants you early access and a few other things, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.